although we can't see you just yet, but I'm sure we'll be able to see you soon. Yep. Um, looking forward to a great night. And um, I might just open in prayer and then we'll get to... Mike's going to do most of the sharing tonight. You've done some great work putting together some, some notes. We're talking about are we in peace or in pieces tonight? So a bit of a play on words, which I'm looking forward to. Well, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather together tonight online. I just pray, Lord, that you would just uh, be with all those that are watching, Lord, whether live or uh, later on. Lord, that you'd, uh, by your Holy Spirit, just uh, really speak into their hearts and lives. And Lord, that you'd anoint the words that we share tonight. And Lord, that you would just uh, give us a great time together studying your word. We just commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Take it away, mate. All right. So um, last time we last time we uh, were speaking about uh, reading the Bible in a bit more depth, and Andrew brought a passage that I thought we just needed to stop and have a, have a think about. So um, I felt very much to pause in the series on reading the Bible as one of the passages was, was really resonated with me that we read last week, and I felt that we needed to just stop and have a look so that passage uh was philippians 4 8 so andrew you're going to do the, yep. the, those bits yeah Thank all you. right so philippians 4 8 says and now dear brothers and sisters one final thing fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable think about or meditate on these things that are excellent and worthy of praise so as we've labored to explain the importance of context in our reading, I wanted to look at this passage in a bit more detail. The first thing we notice in this verse is it is in fact, it is the, the last thing. Um, the phrase and now might also read finally. Most translations read from now on or in conclusion. We could easily be tempted to consider and now as a subject change and to treat this verse in isolation, mm. but the grammar doesn't really permit us to do that. Some translations render it subtly closer as hereafter, for the future, or henceforth. So what are we to do? We see that this instruction about meditating on these things isn't some kind of afterthought, but building on something before and an ongoing activity for the future. So I wanted to take a look at the before part to see what we might have missed and, and see how amazing those promises are. Because hmm. I guess the thing to pick up is that Philippians 4 eight is... At the almost at the very end of the book so and it was written as a letter it wasn't just you know one chapter no. or you know a thought uh passing thought like so this is really the culmination of the whole teaching that he's been bringing to that it is. church so um it uh so i wanted to to go through four points um hopefully i can get through them all so i'm going to go pretty fast um, if you're watching this afterwards, you might want to play it on half speed. If I speak <laughs> in a high-pitched voice and talk it, then it will play back normal. Perfectly. So, yeah. So, <laughs> point number one, stand firm in the Lord. So, chapter four, verse one. All right. So, that says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. So, here's one of those therefore statements. So, we must take a look at the chapter before, because this is verse one. Remembering that, as Andrew just said, the chapter and the verses weren't there in the original text. Mm. So um, let's just wind back a little bit. So Philippians 3, 17, Andrew. All right. So from 17 to, 20. to 21. So this is the, the end of chapter three. Yep. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things. I thought that was interesting to about appetite when we were in the middle of a fast for church. Yeah. Well, that's why I've got no food analogies. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but anyway, so it says um, their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our saviour. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. So Paul is talking about people that really upset him because of the way that so-called Christians were acting up. If you want to go into that in a lot more detail, take a big nose dive into 1 and 2 Corinthians, um, because that's just, yeah, that's actually really, really quite encouraging, mm. um, just because of the way that you and I tick. And my personal experience, I think Christians can be some of the most hurtful people you can ever meet. 
But Paul is addressing this quite bluntly here. He's reminding us who we are, where we're going, and what will happen in the future. Mm. And by fairly blunt implication, get over yourself and straighten yourself up. Yeah. So Philippians 4.1 naturally starts with a therefore stay true to the Lord. That's yeah. what it says. That's right. So point two, it's a call to right living. So chapter four, verses two and three, we're working our way through chapter four. So mm -hmm. verses two and three. So we're working our way towards verse eight, really, isn't well, we it? Are, yes. where we started. So verses two and three says, now I appeal to Euodia and Sintich, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life so we don't depart from this topic of right living for we see paul imploring two women both experienced in the ministry and um, who he holds in high regard to stop squabbling and live in like mind we don't know what the issue was about but today it might be a stupid issue like did the kiwis really invent the path <laughs> or marmite versus veggie mice i've got food in there well, well done. Yes, there it is. There There's is. the food analogy. But it was serious enough to name and shame them in the context of chapter three, bringing to bring alignment to the expectation of right living. Maybe one was a Queenslander and one was a blue supporter. Oh, <laughs> well, I can't take a seat. On no, that. that's no. right. You got no interest. That's <laughs> sad. Very sad. I don't know. Let's see. We are also given a clue. We can't just be right living by ourselves, and it's the spirit of christ jesus living in us and as we looked at last time what goes in comes out mm. uh, but he also gives us hope even though they weren't getting along at the time he tells us that they are included in a list of people whose names are written in the book of life so we can find comfort that even when we find ourselves in divisive situations our hope is still secure and what other people think of us can't topple our salvation even Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen 16, that he doesn't care that people even think him a fool for what he's passionate about. And then goes on to list his great persecutions that he endured to get the gospel to the lost. Mm. Let our practice catch up with our position. It is not that we are sinless, but that we should sin less. Yeah, that's a good point. So our point. I think that goes along with on the weekend. We were having a chat about the idea of as salvation, sanctification, and glorification. Don't spoil the next one. And this, well, this is really where these ladies are at, I think, you know, they're mm. working up their sanctification. And so they're, you know, obviously having a bit of a, a fight or disagreement over something. Um, but what Paul's saying is that they haven't lost their salvation, you know. So that's something that, um, you know, people can sometimes get derailed by. They think, oh, yeah, I've blown it. I'm, you know, not good enough. But that's not actually the case. It's just a matter of God's refining us. Yeah, well, so I mean, if you were in an Armenian church or a Calvinistic church, then you would probably have a different view on that. <laughs> yeah, but that's we're, right. We're not, so that's all good. <laughs> so, uh, point three, choose joy. Um, I know many people called joy. I don't necessarily choose them. <laughs> um, but uh, choose joy. So chapter four, verse four, Andrew. You chose Nadine instead. So I did, yeah. <laughs> well, her name means hope. So oh, there you go. Yeah. You chose hope instead of joy. Hope. Yeah. <laughs> so verse four says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We are commanded twice to rejoice in the Lord. What is joy? It's not the same thing as being happy, mm. as in happenstance. This is a temporary euphoria caused by circumstances. Joy defined here is a verb, not a feeling. It is a doing, an active word, an attitude, a choice. It means to live well, to thrive, to be exceedingly glad in the face of adversity. Horatio Spafford expressed this transcendent attitude when he penned these words after tragedy, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. And as I said to Harry on Sunday, um, it says elsewhere, it says, if Satan can buffet, so can I. <laughs> That's right. Um, I think it's an interesting, you know, that, that hymn, I mean, for those, I mean, probably a lot of people know the story, but he lost his wife and his kids at sea yes and so to read that line you know when sorrows like sea, sea billows, billows roll, roll like that's a really descriptive line that i've never and once i heard the story i've never been able to sing that hymn the same because you really get the idea that this guy really understood what it meant to have sea billows roll like the sea took his family mm. and yet he said it is well with my soul that's pretty powerful it is um 
I, I love the old hymns. Mm. I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, ashamed to say that, and I'll bring them in whenever I can because yeah. I remember a lot of them because they're so meaningful. That's and, right. And full of that. There's of so stuff. much meat and so much, you know, as you say, meaning to them. I might drop another one in in a bit. <laughs> so Matthew Henry commentated concerning our choice to be joyful. He says, he said, observe it is our duty and privilege to rejoice in God and to rejoice in all ways at all times and in all conditions even when we suffer for him or are afflicted by him. We must not think the worst of him or of his ways, for the hardship we meet with is his service. There is enough in God to furnish us with matters of joy in the worst circumstances on earth. Joy in God is a duty of great consequence in the Christian life, and Christians need to be again and again called to it. If good men have not a continual feast, it is their own fault. Mm. And I think that's actually really kind of, uh, you know, to have joy is actually not something that we either do or we don't got. Yeah. We have to got it. By, yeah. it's, it's down to us. Well, it's interesting. You know, he calls it a duty. Like, that's interesting you know, that you wouldn't re often think of joy as a duty. No. But it's actually something that, as you say, we choose it. It's not something that it just sort of happens to you. But you, and oftentimes when we're going through these tough times in life, we're choosing joy. It's not something that, uh, you know, you just sort of think, oh, well, that's the easy option. And I think it's not also, um, it's not that Christian denial of things as well. We can mm. very easily fall into the trap of yeah. saying, I'm a Christian, therefore I need to be happy and I need to deny my circumstances. You know, right now I know people, um, even this this hour that are having tests to figure out whether their cancer has, has come back or not. Mm. And that is not something that is just a... a a, a glib oh well i'll just deny my circumstances these are things that really ha have an effect on our life yeah but it's the position that we have in the face of joy yeah. is something that we can have in the face of it's not instead of mm. and and um and we'll get to the peace in a bit where it's in the face of mm. rather than instead of and yeah. that's really important to make that distinction so true I'll just say good day to a few people while, while we're here. Daniel, our Andrew, watching. Uh, Rhonda, good day. How are you going? And Martin, nice to have you. On my mother-in-law. Mother oh, okay. My mother-in-law's watching. Oh, nice. Hi, Martin. <laughs> How are you? So that's the ones I can see. There might be others, but uh, great to have you guys on board with us tonight. Now I've got to be careful because I know my mother-in-law's That's right. Yes, watching. you have to And speak. I know my mum's going to be watching later <laughs> as well, so. <laughs> She'll be watching on half speed. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so point number four um we're coming oh no we haven't got there yet almost psalm 104 33 all so right we're talking about the being being joyful still yeah this is a good one psalm 104 33 and 34 i will sing unto the lord as long as i live i will sing praise to my god while i have my being let my meditation be pleasing to him as for me i shall be glad in the lord i like that because it said i will mm. and i will and I, as for me, I shall. Yeah. Uh, and I think it, um, David, I, I assume, is it's writing this is is obviously not in a great place, but he's deciding to, mm. you know, I beat my breast and tell my soul to praise the Lord kind yeah. of thing. Um, so well, that's um, what he did when he was, um, yeah. They remember they came back to Ziklag um, after they'd been on some raid, and they came back to discover that all their families had been you know, kidnapped and their city had been burned and everything, and that all his men were talking about stoning him like he was in a pretty bad place but he did just that he spoke to his soul and said you know i'm going to make a decision here um i'm going to look to the lord and draw my strength on him um you know and that's indicative of that as well you know i'm going to sing unto the lord no matter what's going on um and that's really where you know those decisions that we make actually bring about what we're talking about tonight so now we come to um bringing all this together a little bit um point four then you will experience peace and so as we've been working through the top end of uh, philippians chapter four verses one and, and two three four five now we're getting into six and seven um and i'd like to kind of really bring this whole thing to a, a peak um as it were so andrew would you mind yep so verses six and seven says don't worry about anything instead pray about everything tell god what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. 
So this is that famous passage that it says, where it says, the peace that passes all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ mm. Jesus. And I, and I think, well, it's one of those passages where we just pull out that one verse and we go, oh, but peace can be mine. It's a claim, yeah. it's a promise. And actually, I just, um, we read it far too quickly. We say it far too quickly and we band it around like a magic wand, like many of the phrases mm. in the Bible that we just can't do. Um, so... Um, this week I had to arrest myself, well actually it was last week because I prepared these notes last week, I had to arrest myself and slow down to see everything here. Have you ever seen a slow-mo video of a sports event where they slow things down so they can check the details uh, we missed, with, that we miss in the sheer speed of the moment? Like the gymnasts that come off the horse and then they stop them in midair and they move the camera all the way around like mm. something out of the Matrix so you can <laughs> see exactly what they're doing. And that's what I want to do here. I just want to slow right down. I'm not going to slow right down. I thought you were going to use a football analogy then, Mike. What's going on? (laughs) No no chance. So so what what we see in this passage, and I like the way that it renders here. I think it was the New Living Translation that I I took that particular Mm. passage from. It says, hey, don't worry about anything. Um, And that's not the same as... um, not having concerns because mm. the bible talks about bringing our concerns to god cast all your burdens onto him yeah. not denial of your circumstances it's just to, to not worry worry doesn't do anything worry is counterproductive worry is destructive worry is that conversation that you have with yourself in the bathroom when you're arguing about something in your head in your head and all it does is it creates uh puts you in a negative space mm. and, and that negativity that just sort of sits like like sludge on your heart and yeah. it just comes out somewhere yeah and it's just, just not productive at all mm. so don't worry about anything instead instead pray about everything tell god what you need and thank him for what he has done mm. and verse seven then you will experience god's peace which exceeds anything we can understand his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in christ jesus so instead of building up that negativity inside of you through the circumstances that you're in we're talking about guarding our hearts and our minds and it, we just take a, a nod to the armor of god it's not about putting a helmet on to to protect your mind particularly it's to, to remind you that you are saved it's to remind you that you're in the mm. breastplate is to say i have the righteousness that uh, that i that i have in christ jesus you don't have to do anything to get that you just have to continue to remind yourself that that's what you have so it's about position so can we see the priority here we've been encouraged to change our perspective if we go straight for the end game like can i i'm just going to go for the peace i'm going to get the peace may the peace of god be with you peace be with you people and get the try and get that thing it's like trying to find the ikea shortcut to get peace (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but find ourselves back stuck in the restaurant where rumor has it they make the meatballs out of all of the lost souls that just can't get out <laughs> so god takes us <laughs> sorry about that there's another food analogy we've done it again <laughs> yeah i have had the meatballs they're okay <laughs> the, the hot dogs no yeah um even though there's... anyway god takes us on a journey of <laughs> I could stick them on it god takes us on a journey of first getting our focus off of ourselves and turning our focus toward god and then turning our attention that Mm. is reminding ourselves just how big powerful and capable god is then we have returned or retuned ourselves back to the way god wants us to Mm. be and then his peace can come you see if you don't get the don't worry about anything instead pray about anything tell god what you need if you haven't got that in the first place then you can't get that peace because you're not tuned right Mm. You're not in the way of accepting peace because you still got all that other stuff clogging yeah, exactly. up. Yeah. So I think that um, I was just thinking about you know that old phrase you know problem shared is a problem halved. No, it's a problem doubled. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know how it helps. Well, I think if you share it with God, the truth. you share your problems with God, which is what it says. <laughs> tell God what you need. Tell him your problems, and then it's like actually, you know, then He's going to flood in with His peace. Well, that's right. So yeah. sorry, that's gonna... I've been a bit sort of psychological <laughs> on that one. Um, so, yeah, can you see what he's trying to do here? He's trying to recalibrate us. He's trying to mm. get ourselves rightly aligned, really, so that we can actually experience what he has for us. Um, so, but as the old joke goes, how many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? One. There's a few answers to that question. But... Well, the, the one I like is, is one, but it has to want to change. 
and <laughs> and that's the thing is that you know it's a, it's a choice by us peace is a choice i'm sure andrew flitch would have an answer for that one as well I'm just sure. quietly <laughs> Um, so the following two scriptures show scriptures show us what we need to do. So this is uh, 1 Peter 5, 6 to 8. Therefore, humble yourselves. There's a therefore there, Mike. We'll have to go back. We'll have to go back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we'll do that next time. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, self-controlled, be vigilant, watchful, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and of course i think is that the amplified that you've quite no, because it's all the, okay but yes the, the brackets are mine okay that's your addition isn't so the word may of course is a, a good one isn't it because it's um you know the the what he who he may devour um is really dependent on our response isn't it well it is and so if you position yourself <laughs> you can position yourself so he may not mm. and I, that, that wasn't mine that somebody said that and i was like that's really good he yeah that he may didn't know he may not mm -hmm. he said, you don't have to you exactly. can say no yes i don't that's have right. to <laughs> yeah. i don't have to be positioned like that too right so um and what, what else have we got so second corinthians 17 verse 18 is the second one it's uh, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles that we can see. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Um, That's wonderful. And a promise from Isaiah that just really sums all that up. So Isaiah 26 verse 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all <clears> whose <throat> thoughts are fixed on you. So once again, I think there's an imperative on us fixing our thoughts on him. You know, it's not just a fleeting thought or just a mental ascent, but uh, it's actually having our thoughts fixed on Christ. And uh, that peace is promised, the perfect peace. Oh, I it's think it's just a thing. reminder, as well, again, that Christianity isn't passive. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think that you, you can sometimes fall into, again, the trap of turning up on a Sunday and doing your bit on a Sunday, but actually it's, it's far from it. It's, yeah. it's how you apply that on a day, on a day to day. <laughs> Yeah. And when you wake up in the morning, what are you positioning? Are you are you, uh, are you a um, um, good Lord? It's morning, or are you oh you know good morning, Lord. good good morning, Lord <laughs> type of thing? You know, it's which which way you're going to go? Yeah, so true. So we see a process unfolding here in Philippians four. So in summary, we've we've got we have to stand firm in the Lord, and that talks about um, uh, knowing your position and having a responsibility to live out that according to how uh, according to what you are called and who we are called to be um, we're called to choose joy in spite of not instead of our circumstances mm. we're, we're commanded to not worry and we've just read what to do with that worry uh, we're, we're asked to pray we're asked to ask god for things we're asked to thank god for things and by this time we've already got ourselves into a position where we can go and lord we, I, I'm ready to receive your peace because mm -hmm. I've, I've prayed through all of these things. Yeah. I've told you what I need. You know my heart and and, and let that happen. And it, and it really does work. Yeah. And just to really hammer this home, Paul even spells it out in almost, I was gobsmacked when I found this because I, I was developing these bullet points in, in my head. And then I came across 1 Thessalonians 5, yeah. 1 Thessalonians 5, which, which says literally the three points. That's right. Well, it's the very, two very short verses. And then verse 18 is a little bit longer. But 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 says, always be joyful. Verse 17, never stop praying. And then verse 18 says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And I love the fact that he says to be thankful in circumstances. It doesn't say be thankful for them. So it doesn't say, oh, thank you, Lord, that my I've got a flat tire or thank you, Lord, that I've got no money in the bank. But no, we can be thankful in the circumstance, not necessarily for it. But mm. as we do, you know, there's a, some great promises that we receive. Yeah. And I did say I was going to dive back into the hymns and I make no apologies for that. <laughs> Fanny Crosby wrote in the hymn Blessed Assurance, which I did quote a tiny bit from last time, seems to sum up Paul's sentiment across Philippians three and four so eloquently. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my saviour, am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Mm. We are not exempt from actions on our part, as we have seen, 
but the flooding of his peace in our lives as crosby goes on to say is oh what a taste of glory divine mm. and to finish was, was fanny crosby blind was she the one that was blind there was one of those hymn writers that was blind I don't know, just, I'll get Bach and Beethoven mixed up, but that's okay. not the same thing. Yeah, I'm just wondering, because I mean, she's talking about watching and looking and things like that. I just think if she was the one that was blind, that's another one. A bit, that's like, a, that's a whole other thing, a bit like the guy that was, you know, sea billows rolling and feeling yeah. peace. Just amazing. Well, I, I didn't dig too much into that. Mm, I'll have to look into it. Yeah. yeah. Maybe someone can Google it for me. Peter, can you Google? Was Fanny Crosby? Oh, there yes, we go. Andrew says she was. Thank she you. Was. She was blind. <laughs> amazing. So that, I mean, it, once again, it adds a whole different light to it, doesn't it? When you think about you know, she's saying watching and waiting, looking above. Here's this, you know, blind woman that's uh, writing these incredible lyrics. Mm. It's just so much depth. You know, sorry, I got you. No, no, it's there. all right. Um, so to finish something from Thomas Chisel, I reckon, um, who wrote the majestic hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I'm, I'm pulling all of these out this week. It's been really yeah. awesome just to revisit some of these. We things. should sing one before we finish. What do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You don't want to think about it. <laughs> Look, I was going to I was going to sing when I was about on Sunday. Okay, but I thought I would empty the room. Yeah, that's right. So as it goes, <laughs> half the people at the back couldn't hear me anyway, so I could have got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, uh, Thomas Chisholm, who wrote "Great Is Thy Faithfulness," said, "My income has not been at large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me on to until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God." and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his providing care for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. Mm, that's amazing. And the final verse of that great hymn ends, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for each day and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with 10,000s beside. Mm. What a way to finish. That's wonderful. So good. So that's how we find peace. It's a, a it's a process for sure, and there's lots that we have to do in the in the middle of it. We don't just sort of sit there and go, "Oh God, here here I am, oh, give you, me give, me, give peace. me peace." But uh, He expects us to be a part of the process as well. But certainly, He's good to His word, isn't He? You know, if we just follow those very simple steps, uh, He promises it, and He and He fulfills His promise. I mean, it's, I I'm uh, yeah can say uh, I have experienced anxiety. And I've experienced God's peace and I can, you know, any day of the week, I'll take God's peace. Thank you very mm. much. But there's a you know, a process that we've got to do. We've got to be thankful. We've got to choose joy. All these different things that we've talked about tonight that actually result in that peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't change the circumstances, but no. it, does change the, it does change the way we look at them. Exactly. And no, so Peter, true. I am not going to sing. <laughs> 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 oh, I reckon maybe. Well, what about Friday night? You can sing when we. Yeah, no, I'm at not. At the coffee night. No. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if somebody can sneak something in the coffee, they might. <laughs> but that's not, that's not the kind of event. Okay, that's right. Just to be no, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wraps us up for the night. But yes, remember, we do have men's coffee night happening on Friday, and somebody sitting beside me is going to be sharing his testimony. So um, come along to that, guys, uh, if you can. Uh, that'll be seven at uh, Cafe, Cafe 63, 63 yeah. at uh, Coomera, Westfield. Um, we've also got online prayer on Thursday night. Norell and I'll be leading us in prayer. So do join in and be a part of that on Thursday. And uh, of course, then we're back around for uh, for Sunday. And we do want to say go the Queenslanders tomorrow night. Go the Maroons. Is that what you said, Mike? Maroons. <laughs> say it properly. Go the Maroons. <laughs> Look, it says it on my shirt. Maroons. It's backwards. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, have a great week. And uh, make sure you share this with your friends as well and encourage them to be a part of what we're doing through the week with uh, prayer and devotions and uh, the Sunday service as well. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone face to face Friday night for the guys, yep. Sunday at church for everybody else. And uh, have a great week. God bless you. And uh, we'll talk Good again night, soon. everybody. <laughs>